Some say the only way to truly stop this virus in its tracks is to find a vaccine, but that is not a certainty. Just how fast can we do it? Vaccines have to go through several stages of testing before they're used on you and me to check they're safe and they're effective. First, you have to find something you think might work. Then you put it through preclinical trials in the lab and on animals. Then there are three phases of human trials, from small safety studies to much bigger efficacy trials. Then finally, they have to be approved by the regulator. This often takes up to 15 years but some are hoping to condense it all to just 18 months. We hope to accelerate the timeline. So you can see that we probably will get the correct amount of data on whether the vaccine actually works. What we may not have as much of is long-term safety information. Is the new vaccine safe? Three years or four years or five years after it's, it's initially given. And the second part is we don't know how long those protective responses, if they're there, will last. It's a fine balance between safety and speed. Plus, we still got a lot to learn about how our immune system responds to this coronavirus and how it might mutate, both factors that will affect a vaccine. We are basing our six to 18 month timeline on the assumption that everything works well. And, you know, it, it often doesn't work that way. You know, the, the failure rate for vaccines going from, from laboratory to final market authorization and, and sale is 93%. And there are politics at play too. Just because a vaccine has been developed doesn't mean everyone will have access to it. Who gets it first? How much do they pay for it? Countries under the auspices of the World Health Organization have been debating ways to ensure patents don't stop everyone from getting the treatment they need. What's happening at the WHO at this moment is um, discussions around how to ensure that the, the, the drugs, the vaccines, the diagnostics that are being developed to, to be able to respond to the, to the COVID-19 pandemic will be available universally for everyone on the planet. It is particularly important because we now see vast amounts of money, public financing being poured into the development of these products, but we need to have strings attached to that financing. If you can say, here's the money, but the results of that research will need to be pooled. But it's been a diplomatic struggle. Newsnight has seen early drafts of the negotiations where countries with big pharmaceutical industries, such as the US, Switzerland and the UK, have been cautious about sharing the rights with others to freely use their discoveries around treatments and vaccines for COVID-19. Well, sort of the usual suspects that always um, make trouble, so to speak, as soon as the term intellectual property is used, they'll say, oh, no, 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 we can't really, really talk about that because um, that will harm innovation or that will upset our pharmaceutical industry or we really need a very different approach based on this concept of the global public good and the concept of solidarity. We understand the UK is now supportive of the WHO pushing for equitable access to and fair distribution of affordable essential health technologies and the urgent removal of unjustified obstacles. Some experts are worried that these declarations might end up being toothless because the stakes are so high. In previous outbreaks, richer countries have placed pre-orders of vaccines, putting poorer countries at the back of the queue. Their fears played out this week when the chief executive of Sanofi, a big French drug company, said they would likely give the US their vaccine first because the US partly funded it. This prompted an outcry by the French government and Sanofi have rolled back on some of their claims. In the UK, researchers developing a vaccine at Oxford with support from the public purse have said people here will get quick access, but so too will people from low and middle income countries. However, universities allied for essential medicines, a pressure group, suggests that the UK is funding 24 other similar projects which are yet to declare who gets access to their research and at what cost. So, for a lot of people, how soon the vaccine comes is as much about politics and who develops it as it is about whether it exists at all.
Deborah Cohen reporting. Well, joining me now is the director of the Wellcome Trust, Sir Jeremy Farr, who is also a member of the SAGE Committee. Uh, Sir Jeremy, good evening to you. Um, mm -hmm. Wellcome has uh, contributed upwards of $100 million into a search for a vaccine, along with a number of other companies. When you put that money in, did you get a guarantee of who that vaccine would be for, in the sense that it wouldn't be entirely a commercial concern, it would be about affordability? Yeah, this, this uh, money that Wellcome put in, just to say we're not a company, we're a philanthropic organisation, um, but when we put that money in, it was alongside many countries, Germany, uh, Norway, Japan, the UK, Belgium, uh, countries all around the world, Mexico, Ethiopia. Um, and the Gates Foundation, and it was put in in order to pool resources so that we could advance a number of different vaccines for COVID-19 and actually some other diseases, uh, but that we would ensure that when those vaccines were produced, if they were produced, uh, that they would be available to everybody that needed them. And that's a, a prerequisite of the funding that comes under yeah. the umbrella of CEPI, which is part of this global movement to make sure that we have vaccines available for everybody. Yes, but, you know, given that there's upwards of 7 billion people in the world, I wonder, you know, how you make decisions about, for example, I mean, it sounds such a crude thing to say, but the price point, because it's not free at the point of use. There has to be some question of a return for somebody. So how do you decide? Well, firstly, it does have to be free for use for the world at the point of delivery. That is one of the uh, engraved uh, principles that we're all working working towards. Yes, of course, somebody has to pay for that. Somebody has to pay for the risk. Somebody has to pay for the, the research, the manufacturing, the distribution, everything that goes with taking science into a vaccine and then vaccines into vaccination. And that's what we're supporting. And in fact, most countries of the world are supporting. Um, and there has to be a payment for that, but that is coming from a combination of the public resources, uh, and therefore the public resources have to have a say in how those vaccines are used, and philanthropy, and yes, some of the expertise, a lot of the expertise of industry. If we think of this as us and them, if we think of this as philanthropy or governments or industry working in isolation on their own, we are going to face a horribly tense a few months and years ahead of us. But you've what got we to, need to do yeah, is but, bring those together. But but that you know, historically that's not always worked. And I wonder when you look at the Zanoffi case, and you say, well, America puts money in. Donald Trump says, you know, if we get this vaccine away, then it's America first. Are you really telling me that we're going to have some kind of incredible altruism that's going to break out into the world and affect everybody? I am. I am because actually it's not. It is altruism. It is. A global public good, but it's also enlightened self-interest. Uh -huh. um, yes, that Sanofi GSK vaccine may go forward. I would say that the French government and indeed CEPI has funded some of that work in Paris that's led up to it. So this is not an American vaccine as such. Uh, the vaccine may come from Cuba. It Sorry. could come from Russia. It could come from China. And actually, it's in everybody's enlightened self-interest, including actually the United States, to make sure that we pool the resources and then every country has access to that vaccine through a pooled resource. Are, Anything, you sure the, are you sure the White House sees it that way? Doesn't it depend? Sorry, doesn't it depend on who's in the White House? <laughs> I'm not getting into politics. Um, it doesn't bother me who's in the White House. What bothers me is do we invest in the vaccine research and development? Do we invest in the manufacturing? And do we commit ourselves that we will make this vaccine available to, yes, to the 7 billion yeah. people in the world in an unprecedented way. We've never done this before, but we're facing an unprecedented yeah. crisis so, that the world has never faced on before. Our way, on if our, we do things as we would normally do it, we won't be able to vaccinate the world. On our way to a vaccine, uh, we hear today that there's news on an antibody test. There's been news from first the Swiss um, a pharmaceutical giant Roche and then the American uh, one to Abbott to say that they have got a 100% effective antibody. Now that has not, we haven't seen the data on that, so therefore we need to make sure before it gets approval that we've got all the data. You know, in your view, how long before the data is out and how long before we might get approval? I, I think it will come, the approvals will come quickly. These are good tests. Are they perfect? No, uh, it's very, very difficult to develop an absolutely perfect uh, antibody test that's of use in all ages, across all countries, all ethnic groups. Uh, it's very difficult to produce that. But it will be much better than anything we've had to date, and it's able to be produced 
at an industrial scale so that we can roll antibody testing out in this country and indeed uh, around the world. But antibody testing is only part of it. Antibody testing tells you if you've had the infection in the past, it doesn't tell you if you've got the infection today. And right. so it can only be worked alongside other tests and that indeed, tell us if we're And infected indeed, which today. brings me on to your role in SAGE. And just a chance for a very quick question. You'll have heard Jeremy Hunt today say there's too much secrecy in SAGE. You know, why did they not discuss the model the way the South Koreans were doing it? You've always been one who said that there should be more transparency in SAGE. So therefore, I wonder if you would tell me now in, 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 the, in the kind of question of transparency, the minutes of SAGE are still secret. So did SAGE approve the change on the 12th of March of the policy to drop contract, contact uh, uh, and trace and isolate? Did SAGE I, approve I, that? I, I do not remember the truth of that on the 12th of March. I've always insisted, A, that I'm transparent about being on SAGE, yes, and that, and that testing has been absolutely critical to every country that has successfully so far controlled the epidemic. And as we go forward into this very vulnerable time, when r remains quite high, infection rates in this country remain high, we still have three overlapping epidemics, community, care homes and hospitals, that we must not lift the restrictions anywhere, any, in any rapid way, because if we do, that r naught will go above one and we will back into the exponential phase. The only way we can do that is to lift restrictions incredibly carefully and make sure that we've got testing in place isolation and contact tracing and we should not be lifting more of those restrictions until that test isolation contact tracing is in place we must learn the lessons yes. of why this epidemic got out of control in february and march and we must not allow that mistake to be happening in may june and july so very briefly was it a mistake to stop that to change the policy was it a mistake? i think in retrospect it was yes i think Thank we should you. have been testing earlier and we should have been testing more thoroughly across the whole community and in care homes and in hospitals Thank you so much. Thank you.